All right, let's quickly say something about Musk buying Twitter, and then I'll go to your questions, because I know there are a lot of them now. Uh, please, no more under $20 questions, because I, I, do, I don't want to make this show too long. Um, and we're already at 866, and um, I am starting to feel like maybe I'm losing my voice, and I don't want to get to the point where I actually am losing my voice. All right, um, so Musk has put in an offer to buy Twitter, uh, which is pretty amazing. Uh, it's about $50 billion. Uh, this is his own money. I don't know of another example of an individual uh, buying a company for this kind of money. I would have to do my research to figure it out. Um, but, um, you know, but I, I, uh, <coughs> I, don't, I don't know. Um, it, it is partially amazing because of the, the rationale that uh, Elon Musk is using. He's using the rationale of he wants Twitter to be better, not more profitable necessarily, just better in terms of being a better platform for speech. Uh, I think it's a great motivation, uh, particularly for a private investor who doesn't have shareholders and it doesn't have to worry about how he uses shareholder money. I think it's great that a private individual Wants to, wants to change the direction of a company, wants to use it for what he sees as the good. I think this is phenomenal. As I said on my show on Musk and Twitter last time, I think this is a great example of how capitalism works. It doesn't just work to, um, you know, uh, promote materialistic values. It also works to promote other values. And here you get an example of somebody trying to promote a society with more speech rather than less. Uh, I think that's incredibly noble and good, uh, and that's what Elon Musk is doing, and he's willing to engage in a hostile takeover in order to achieve it. Uh, that is a beautiful thing. I, I think what's happening with Musk and Twitter is a validation of capitalism, a validation of uh, how capitalism works and uh, the efficaciousness of capitalism, whether he succeeds or fails. Uh, it is such a validation because um, the fact is that uh, he, he'll probably fail because of a lack of capitalism, and I'll explain in a minute in, in, uh, in the world in which we live. Um, so, um, you know, Elon has put in a, a significant bid, a significant premium on what the stock was pre trading at. Um, but why did he put in this bid? Because, of course, the bid now makes it clear what his aims are. The bid also, um, uh, you know, uh, gives an opportunity for other bidders to get organized and to potentially outbid Elon. Uh, the bid also makes it possible for the company itself to defend itself, and it already has. It is, uh, I think it has already voted to put in a poison pill or is at least talking about um, putting in a, uh, a poison pill. Uh, so, um, you know, that is, uh, it is a, uh, <coughs> it's a significant issue. Uh, so we'll get to what are poison pills and how they work. But the fact is, that the fact that he had to make a, a bid for the company, um, gave the company enough time to put together a defense. And in this case, the defense is the poison pill. So why did he have to put in uh, a bid for the company? Because of security law. Um, basically, in 1968, securities law um, prevents somebody from stealthily, stealthily just means on the quiet, on the hush-hush, Buying 60% or 51%, sorry, 51% of a company and firing its CEO. Before 1968, that could be done. And indeed, that was done. It was done regularly in corporate America. Companies were bought out by the buyer buying 51% of a company without disclosing the fact that it was doing so. And then basically, once it reached 51%, firing the CEO and declaring that it now owned this, this company. CEOs, uh, CEOs of companies that were afraid of being bought out. Note that, that something like that happens. If you're buying 
of a company on the quiet necessarily bids up the price of the stock. So you have to be willing to put more and more and more of your own money into buying the stock, and you buy 51%. And then you have to believe that the stock is worth more than what you paid for it um, to justify this, which means that you believe that management were not doing a good job maximizing the profit-generating uh, potential of the assets of the company. And that's what was going on. It was a huge era of takeovers during the 1960s uh, in which uh, uh, companies were taken out because the belief was they were mismanaging the assets. You could argue Twitter is mismanaging the asset that it has. Twitter is not a particularly, if at all, profitable company. So even on the basis of profit, not just on the basis of speech, Twitter is not doing a great job. So. In 1968, because managers lobbied Congress to protect themselves, Congress passed the 1968 security law. This is, the this is a real example of cronyism. This is an example of managers, CEOs, lobbying Congress to protect themselves, all in the name of shareholders. And what they said was, what the law says was, is that you cannot accumulate stock without letting the world know why you're accumulating it. And if you want to maintain, if you want to get control over a company, the only way to get control over a company is to do what's called a tender offer, to publicly announce that you want to take over the company and, yeah, it's called the Williams Act. Um, you want to take over a company and you're willing to pay X for it. And the reasoning they gave, the reason why this was presented as good for shareholders is, one, uh, you would have to pay more shareholders. You wouldn't just pay incrementally a little bit more as you gain towards 51%. You would accumulate stock, let's say, up until 10%, because at 10%, you would have to make your intention public. And then anything beyond that, you would have to pay this tender price, which would have to be significantly higher. So shareholders would get more. But more than that it would open up the company for bidding because now other people would know that you're interested in this company and they could then step in and say, well, we're willing to give, you're willing to give 40, we'll give 42. And then there'd be a bidding war that would drive the price up. So this is supposedly good for shareholders and indeed for some shareholders, it is very good for companies that are way undervalued and where there's a lot, a lot of buyers and a lot of people would want to buy them. Um, there is a, this would increase the share price. On the other hand, for companies that are marginal, or for companies that you won't, don't expect a lot of bidders, like I think Twitter, um, you're not gonna get a significant increase. And at the margin, a lot of people are not gonna take over the company because of, of um, um, how expensive it was. Now, uh, from 1968 till the 1970s, um, you saw significant decline in hostile takeovers in the United States because of this. And then in the 1980s, people found a way around this, uh, primarily by raising cheap capital, called at the time junk bonds or high yield bonds. Um, it, what, you, what you got is a whole new generation of corporate raiders, uh, people who would come in, buy up companies, break them up, sell off the assets, make a fortune kind of people that um, other people's money, the movies celebrate. And um, the 1980s were a period in which this was celebrated. This was amazing. This was American capitalism, in, in a sense, in this sector at least, reborn, um, American conglomerates being uh, broken up. In, in my view, this is one of the great errors um, in American history. Uh, in, in American financial history and, and a great era for, for American business. It's an era in which we went from uh, inefficient, cumbersome um, uh, conglomerates to efficient, competitive, uh, incredibly profitable businesses uh, of the 90s and 2000s. Well, in the 90s, companies came up with this idea of a poison pill. A poison pill is basically where the board decides that it is going to give preferential treatment to other shareholders other than the one making the tender offer. So they would issue new shares at a very low price, 
and by doing so dilute but issue new shares that they knew that the ten the person tendering for the company uh, didn't have access to was discriminated against and issue these shares at very low price encourage all other shareholders to buy into them and therefore dilute the share ownership of the guy who is tendering and therefore make it prohibitively expensive for them to actually buy the company out. Um, initially, this was fought in court because it, you would think that this would be illegal. This is against their fiduciary duty to protect shareholders. This is a killer of hostile takeovers which are very friendly to shareholders. Um, and indeed, there were courts that determined that it was um, a violation of the fiduciary duty of the board. But then, um, the most important court in the land when it comes to corporate governance, the most important court in the land when it comes to these kind of issues is the Supreme Court of the State of Delaware. Um, the Supreme Court of the State of Delaware ruled that poison pills were, were okay. And as a consequence of them being okay, um, they are now everywhere. And indeed, if you look at the last 20 years, we've had very few hostile takeovers. That whole idea of American um, finance, restructuring American business, of American finance using uh, capital to completely uh, reorient American business towards maximizing shareholder wealth, towards profit maximization, that went away. One of the reasons we've seen so much slow economic growth, the master, thank you, really appreciate that. One of the reasons we've seen so much slow economic growth over the last 20 years is, I think, because finance has been neutered. The ability of financiers to restructure American business has been neutered. And, and, and that's, what we're seeing, that's what we're seeing right now. <coughs> so Twitter is using, uh, well, the reason, by the way, that the Delaware Supreme Court is the court that matters is because the Delaware, because almost every major corporation in the United States is incorporated in Delaware. The reason every major corporation in the United States is incorporated in Delaware, therefore uh, corporate governance is determined by the courts in Delaware, is because Delaware courts are very friendly towards management. Um, and therefore, management has a huge incentive to um, incorporate in Delaware. So there you have it, a quick lesson on corporate governance in America. Um, it's perversion, I think, and it's distortion. Uh, the lack of freedom in accumulating stock in order to buy, the lack of freedom in takeovers, the basic disappearance of hostile takeovers, which is what we're seeing now. Uh, Elon Musk trying to take over Twitter is hostile because the Twitter board does not want him to. Um, it's hard to see a path by which Musk actually succeeds because, uh, sadly, the courts have given uh, boards of directors almost unlimited power to stop people like Elon Musk from taking over their businesses. I think this is a disaster. I think this is horrible, not just because of Twitter, but more broadly for American business. Uh, we will continue to pay the price for this for decades to come. Um, it is a, 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 this is an exact example of the kind of regulation that most of us don't even know exists, most of us don't even know uh, is out there, and yet uh, really limits the ability of markets to function properly, function properly. So it's unlikely um, Musk is going to be able to succeed. Uh, if he does succeed, um, then I think it becomes interesting. Because one of the things I think Musk will discover if he takes on Twitter is how difficult the job is. It's how difficult the job is. Well. Um, well, I think Twitter can probably be run much better than it is. I don't think this issue of speech on Twitter is easy to solve. 
I don't think it's something that you can just do like that. It is some simple principle, some simple rule you can impose. This requires deep, hard thinking. It requires thinking about the kind of culture you want to have, the kind of speech you want to have. Um, it requires uh, rules that are transparent and objective, which are not easy to formulate. Um, and I think Musk will discover that, and that's good. Let Musk use his IQ and let him bring the best people he can find to try to deal with it. But um, so shaking up social media like this would be a terrific thing, would be fantastic, right? Um, you can have any speech you want except threats on your property, not on somebody else's. That's the difference. So um, what kind of speech should you be permitted to have on private property like Twitter is an interesting question, and it's not obvious what the answer is. Um, and uh, it, it's not obvious that uh, Elon Musk has the answers, but I do think that shaking it up, that trying something new on this, that, um, that uh, doing it differently is something worth experimenting with. Um, but those of you who think that this is easy and, uh, and straightforward, I, I think uh, underappreciate the issues involved, and one of these days we'll get into those issues. Maybe if Musk takes them over, we'll get into those issues. But unfortunately, I don't think that's likely to happen. Um, but I, I don't think anybody has the answer to it. A, a clear answer to it. I'm sure people have the answer. But um, it's a real challenge. It's a real challenge. And be a successful company. And make money. Don't forget you have to do that as well. Your job is not to guarantee speech for everybody. Your job is to make money. Um, and so whether you can, how you do all that in, in a corporate structure uh, on a platform like this is super difficult. And nobody else has been successful in creating an alternative, which I find interesting, right? If it was easy, somebody would have done it and created a real alternative. Thank you for listening or watching the Iran Brooks Show. If you'd like to support the show, we make it as easy as possible for you to trade with me. You get value from listening. You get value from watching. Show your appreciation. You can do that by going to iranbookshow.com slash support, by going to Patreon, subscribe star, locals, and just making a appropriate contribution uh, on any one, of those, uh, any one of those channels. Also, if you'd like to see the Iran Book Show grow, please consider sharing our content and, of course, subscribe press that little bell button right down there on YouTube so that you get an announcement when we go live. And for you, those of you who are already subscribers and those of you who are already supporters of the show, thank you. I very much appreciate it.